I'm Sarah Heiner, and this is our Health and Happiness Show on Bottom Line. Um, and thanks for being here. We have a very important topic today. We're going to talk about testing, COVID testing. Um, everybody's scared to death. Everybody's haunted by the headlines. Cases are up, hospitalizations are up, deaths are up, cases are up. They just reported, I think, 200,000 or just about 200,000 cases, new cases yesterday. Well, that's really scary. What does it really mean? Is it really there are all these asymptomatic people? So what's really going out with this test? As usual, the truth may not be as simple. There might be something else lying underneath. So I've got a great guest that's gonna come on in just one second. Let me just remind you of all the things I remind you of regularly. Um, we've got a growing library of these videos of past interviews. You can find them either in our Facebook uh, video, video library on this Facebook page, the bottom line Facebook page, or you can go to YouTube to our Bottom Line Inc. channel. That's sometimes it's a little easier to navigate than Facebook. Tell your friends, share them away. Please let them know that we're here and we're doing these for the most part every once a week, um, generally Thursday afternoons. Every so often we'll switch it up depending on an expert's busy schedule when I can get them. Uh, but please come on along and share this because it's really valuable stuff and you're not getting this. I promise you, no one is gonna tell you what we're gonna talk about today. It's just not being talked about in the mass, in the mass media. Um, one other thing to remind you actually is the best thing you can do for your health and the family of your health, the, the health of your family is to strengthen your immune system. And we have our editors put together a great free download book for you, um, about things that your doctor is not talking about and telling you to do to strengthen your immune system. Because if you have a strong immune system, you don't have to worry as much about getting sick. And there are simple things you can do. It's not all about, you know, defensive staying away from people simple things that will help keep your body strong and help it function in the way that it knows how to function and to do what it knows to do. So there's going to be a link in the, um, in the Facebook chat. So put it on, you know, download that, click on there, download that, share that as well. It's free. We just, honest to goodness, I, I just want everybody healthy. Um, if you have questions for Dr. Nye or I, as we are going through this, put those on in the chat. Someone's going to pass them along to me. Um, so we'll get those in as we can. Um, and if by any chance I don't get to your question, we'll be sure to answer it afterward um, to let you know. All right, with that, let me bring on Dr. Greg Nye. Um, just one second, let me push the button correctly again. Hi, Greg, welcome. Um, Hi, Sarah. Uh, let me introduce you to everybody that's out there. Um, so Greg is the founder, uh, he's a naturopathic physician. Um, and for anyone that doesn't know, naturopaths really are doctors. They went to different medical school. Um, they are highly trained. They, they are trained in understanding the body's ability to heal itself and to understand, work with the body versus suppressing and kind of reductionist medicine. Uh, correct me if I said that wrong, but I think that's kind of the high level philosophy of naturopathic medicine. Um, so Greg is the founder of Immersion Health Clinic in Portland, Oregon. He's a naturopathic physician, a naturopathic oncologist, and an acupuncturist. Um, he's a prominent lecturer at assorted naturopathic medicine conventions and meetings. He's been speaking a lot, talking to a lot of people on many different topics. In particular, he's been researching and writing about the PCR test since the early 1990s, when it was first used with, with AIDS and as part of, part of the AIDS research. Um, you can learn more about him and his work at immersionhealthpdx.com. Okay, did I, was I fair in my description of what of a naturopathic physician? It was totally fine, yeah. Okay. It was okay. a good, good elevator description, yeah. <laughs> well, I think it's important. People don't realize how important. We, we in Bottom Line have talked regularly about actually considering having a naturopathic physician as part of your medical team because it's a different philosophy. Sometimes you definitely need your drugs and surgery, and sometimes you don't, um, and especially in oncology where you, you do a lot of work. I mean, that's always a place where it's exciting to see how they've brought in assorted modalities to kind of surround the treatment. Yeah, right. Yeah, it's, um, it's oncology is maybe one of the most, you know, it gives the most explicit um, scenario where the two worlds really do work best together. Yeah, yeah, it's been great. All right, so let's, before we get to the dirty details of this testing, can you mm -hmm. give just a little bit of background about your experience with PCR testing? Um, because you're a little bit of a hidden gem. <laughs> I can't uh -huh. say you've been on, you know, every major news channel and you've been on every, you know, major magazine. <laughs> so let's tell them why yeah. you're so smart about this. <laughs> 
No, all right, yeah, good. So I initially came into the topic of PCR back in the early 90s. So PCR, I mean, it was developed in the, I think, 1989 was when Kerry Mullis actually came up when it was developed. And in the early 90s is when it started rolling out into the HIV and AIDS world. And I was very much, I was in grad school at that time and and um, was very, very much in the center of that, um, of the discussions around HIV and AIDS that were happening on this new thing that was around called the internet. Um, and so, it, and I became sort of central in a lot of discussions that were happening about the science related to HIV and AIDS. And of course, PCR was very much a part of that. And so I had, was in this kind of great position where I was in contact with many scientists who were doing PCR with HIV and who were gracious enough to spend lots of their time educating me because I would just a curious guy and wanted to really understand what it was that was happening because I was writing a thesis on the topic of, of HIV and AIDS. And right. so I wanted to really know what I was talking about with these things. And so I got lots of, of education at that time about it. And uh, one thing that was very explicit around HIV was that PCR was not to be used as a diagnostic tool to say that somebody had HIV. How and were in they fact, using it then? Say that again? What were they using it for? It was being used for what was called viral load. And so you couldn't even get, I mean, they still use it for that. You couldn't get a, P, a PCR for HIV done until you had been diagnosed positive by the standard diagnostic test, which is a Western blot test, mm -hmm. meaning an antibody test. So you had to first test positive by antibody before you would be allowed to do PCR for HIV. So, so, it so was, let me translate that. So antibody, just for anybody that doesn't know, antibody is what you develop once you've been sick and that shows that your body has developed these warriors that fight a disease. Yes. Right, right? and then the yeah. PCR test was being used when you say viral load to see how much you have. How much of the virus somebody had in their system, right. yeah. And then that, you know, still used as a way of monitoring response to medications and things. And so, so it was very clear at that time why PCR was not allowed to be used diagnostically for HIV. And that everyone sort of understood that to be true. And that was, that was said at the top levels. I mean, Tony Fauci was the head of the same institute back then and as he is now. And he knew that you don't use PCR as a diagnostic test. Were they, um, when they were getting samples for HIV, they weren't doing nasal swabs, were they? What were they doing? How were for HIV, no, for HIV, it was all in blood right. um, because that's where HIV tends to hang out. Yeah. And they've looked for, you know, they look for SARS-CoV-2 in blood and they don't really see it there, but they find it in swabs. So for this one, they're, they get it in swabs. Okay. So then, so there was that back then. And then this, this new thing, this, new phenomenon starts showing up in, you know, February and March is when I'm really starting to become aware of it, you know, late January, but really February and into early March. And I remember at the time hearing that PCR was being used as a way of identifying uh, people that had been infected with this condition. And, you know, so the flags are going up right. to me. And in sometime in early March, I know that I posted out there on the internet that if this, if it ever happens that they start defining a case of this disease as someone testing positive by PCR, we're in a really bad situation. Because at that time, they were not saying that everybody who tested positive was a case. They were simply, trying to identify who was who was infected or not. But to be infected, I mean, a case typically means you have the disease. Right. But once you make that transition from saying case is the disease to saying case is anybody who tests positive, that is an enormous change in terms of how you're going to track, uh, in terms of what it's going to look like when right. you track. And so 
I mean, it was very clear that if we ever start calling the, a case, somebody who tests positive, things are going to go really bad. And so it wasn't long after that, that that's what happened. All right. So and then I want to break down. Let's see. Do I want to go straight? If to, let me ask you this first, and then we're going to break down how the PCR test works and what, sure. you know, what it's doing and why you're saying it doesn't work. If Tony Fauci knows that this was not effective for a diagnostic test, why is are we all doing that? Why is that the, what's being considered the gold standard for it? Because we'll talk about the antigen test as well, the rapid test, which also is, is they say is less effective at testing, at reliability. Yeah, so why would he allow this? Um, that's a good question. Okay. And um, I think what he would say is, well, it's the best we have available. It's the best we can do. So, um, you know, because we haven't, uh, we don't have accurate enough antibody tests or uh, whatever, we don't have accurate enough other tests. And so it's not a perfect test, but it's the best we have. So That's the, so the what's general. The definition, what's the definition of being sick, right? So, well, actually, I'm going to ask you that later. Let's go to the PCR test. All right. So, talk, okay. So, explain, please how the PCR test works, what it's doing. They stick the thing up your nose and then what is it doing? What's it looking for? What is it, what is a positive mean? What is a negative, right? So what what's going on there? Yeah, okay. I'm gonna try this without a whiteboard. Um, so so um, PCR is, uh, so polymerase chain reaction. And the idea is that, so a, a um, a virus is essentially beads on a string and each bead is a nucleotide. So this one is about 30,000 nucleotides in length, total length, the total genome is 30,000 nucleotides. Well, PCR is this very ingenious uh, way of determining if tiny quantities of a virus are present in a sample that you can't see otherwise. You don't have any other method to see in there, but you wonder if the virus is in there. So the way you find out if the virus is in the sample is that you throw in to the sample what are called primers. So primers are these little strips of DNA that bind to a little piece of the virus. So you have this huge long virus, but now we're going to just bind to a tiny little piece here and a tiny little piece here. And, we'll, and PCR is a process of replicating everything in between those two primers. So you, you have this. Know what it is? It figures it out. What's it, it figures it out what's in between. So, and this very good because this is one of the one of the many points at which PCR becomes problematic because if your primer will bind to anything except the target that you want to amplify, then you're going to amplify something that you didn't want to amplify it will be give you a false positive amplification. So it is absolutely essential that your primer bind only to the thing that you're trying to amplify. When you, what we now know, go, what, go ahead. When it binds to a piece, you have oh, 30,000 and it's binding to a fraction of it. Is that enough to identify? Tiny fraction. Yeah. A tiny, tiny fraction, well, fraction, tiny. Um, it's, it's binding to this little piece of it is that enough to know? Yeah. It's like that Chinese you know, joke about the, the blind man and the elephant, like your hands in the back and hands in the front. So is that little yeah, piece yeah. To know, enough to know and unique enough to, to coronavirus or COVID-19 to know that that's that, or is it possible that that also is a similar virus or you know, yes. something else? Yes, so what you're, you're Yes, there are just so many places that this test can be messed up, but yes. So the first question is, is your primer specific for your target? And what we know is that there are three primers, three primer pair. Primers are always in pair because you bind here and you bind, bind here and here, and then you replicate everything in between them. So primers always come in pairs. So what we know is that, is that in 
the standard way that it, in fact, in the way that it was um, initially published to identify this virus, they used three primer pairs, but one of those primer pairs was common to a whole family of coronaviruses, not just, so two of them were theoretically unique, but one was common to many others. And so there could be amplification happening by that one. But the unique pieces, they uniquely find bind to a unique part of the strand. Theoretically, okay. yes. Um, and so then to speak to the other point that you were making, so we have this virus that's 30,000 sequences long. Mm -hmm. These primers bind to this little strip of it, and they actually are, then you replicate what's in between the primers. And what's between these primers are about 70 beads. Out of those 30,000, we're gonna replicate 70 of them. And so then the obvious question is, if you, let's say you find those 70 beads, do we know that the other, all the other beads are there? Right. This test can't tell us that. All it can tell us is that those 70 are there. So what could it be? That it might be broken or it might be 70 Absolutely. that would be common to something else so that it might be an entirely different sickness? Or you yes. Know. Okay. The answer is yes. <laughs> so, um, so let's say that me, healthy person, I get exposed ambiently or that I touch a surface and then wipe my eye and that surface had not full infectious virus, but had a degraded virus because we spray the surfaces and a virus hits it and it degrades. I touch that and then touch a surface. Now I have been exposed to fragments of that 30,000 viral beads. My body then deals with that, you know, it responds and maybe forms antibodies or whatever, but I might have those viral fragments in me. I get PCR. And lo and behold, that those 70 beads are found because it's one of the fragments that I picked up from the environment. Or maybe not even picked it up from the environment. I, maybe somebody I get exposed because somebody coughed in the elevator before I walked in the elevator. I actually inhale infectious virus, but because I have an immune system, I don't get sick. I chop the virus up into little pieces because that's what an immune system does. But if I were to be tested, one of those pieces is going to take, going to contain those 70 beads that will then get replicated on a PCR test. And I would then test positive, even though I successfully fought off the virus. So this is so important. So that, again, I, I'll reiterate just because I'd like to, I'd like to put a point oh, yeah, on right? Sure. You know, just that having the presence of this stuff in your nose or in your throat or wherever it is, doesn't mean you're sick. It means you got stuff there. So that, for example, if you swabbed my nose now, would there be, you know, might there be strep throat in my, in my nose or pneumonia in my nose or any of assorted things, but this is simply what they're looking for. But at any given time, do we all have all sorts of stuff in our noses, yeah. in our mouths, in our throats that if they look for it, we could all be tested positive for in this way? Yeah, there is a, um, there's a book by, uh, he's a writer, I think he writes for the New York Times, Carl Zemmer, and he, he's written a lot of really just okay. interesting science books, and he wrote one about, so I can't, it's about viruses generally, but it was, it's really a fascinating book. I wish I could think of the title offhand, but what stuck in my head was a study that he talked about where they took uh, some like 14 or 25 healthy people and they uh, took samples of lung fluid and they did, I believe they did PCR looking for, maybe it wasn't PCR. Um, it, no, it would have been molecular genetics. It would have been sequencing. Okay. Uh, and they found an, an average, and I'm kind of making up numbers here, but it doesn't matter because it's- It's the concept. It's the concept. On average, people had like 57 different viruses that had never been categorized before resident in their lungs in just healthy people. 
So the point being that we are all filled with viruses. I mean, we constantly have um, genetic, new, these new viral genetic material coming in to our systems that our immune system sniffs it out and, you know, generally are not really relevant to our, you know, to how we're feeling. So yes, the answer, uh, yes, we all have, you know, they could culture all kinds of things if they were to do that kind of study. So what's the definition of being sick? So, so at what point do you go from your gut stuff? And if your body's mounting a response, so, you know, if it's building antigen, so again, we're going to get to the antigen test, but, um, mm -hmm. and I apologize, like everybody out there, this is technical stuff, but I find it fascinating, but also it's important to understand a little bit since we've all been thrown into the science of COVID and the details of COVID. It's important yeah. to under also see what's going on underneath rather than this black box of, of fright, right? And yes, I know that counts and down counts are up, but hospitalizations and deaths. So we're going to talk about that because I'm not saying yeah. that it isn't real. We're just trying to put in perspective this you tested positive, go into a cave for 14 days. Um, so what's the definition of being sick? Like what, what, at what point, cause you're, they have all these positive tests and people go, oh, you got it. Well, like when your body's mounting a reaction and you're, and the warriors are coming and you're developing antigens and a lot of people will develop antibodies. We develop antibodies to things all the time because that's what our bodies do and an immune system does, but you weren't necessarily sick from it. So where, how do you define sickness? You know what I mean? Yeah, so uh, this is another, it's like every way you come at this is a can of worms, but um, so there are, from the CDC standpoint, there are a set of criteria that define the symptoms related to COVID. And they are, I mean, if you read the list, it's like, that's like Everything. anybody. I mean, it's like, a cough and a headache and a and I mean they're really very standard kind of symptoms. Yeah, um, there's a couple of the yeah. unique ones: the loss of smell, loss of taste, and yeah, probably yeah, the, the oxygen common. levels dropping are unique. But things. those things, right. those unique ones, are not required to get the diagnosis. Right. They are if you have um, if you have any of like I think it was two or three of this list of a long list of symptoms without an obvious explanation for why else it might be, yeah. that is then a COVID diagnosis. Yeah. So, well, I was just talking to someone now whose daughter has a headache and she's got a sore throat and they're sticking swabs up her nose. She feels fine. Yeah. Oh, yeah. She has a little bit of a sore throat. Okay. Yeah. 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 That's, the that's where we are. Yeah. Right. So there is, so there, is, there are the sickness, there's the sickness that is associated with being exposed to this pathogen, you know, loss of smell and right. yada yada. And those then become COVID cases. And if they're bad enough, they're COVID hospitalizations. But let's say I, um, let's say I have, uh, I start having heart arrhythmias and I get panicky about it which is, you know, a dozen patients that I've had who get panicky about, now I'm not talking about around COVID, just generally. Right, a sub-symptom of something. Somebody has a symptom, they get panicky, they go to the hospital. Everybody going to a hospital right now is getting tested. And that test is, is pretty much a PCR test. In the state of Oregon, and I believe in pretty much all the states, if you test PCR, when you go into a hospital, you become, if you test positive, you are now a COVID hospitalization. So you have become a case of COVID that is in the hospital. Yes, that's happening in the stats. It's happening in the stats, you're right, because we're seeing these other things that people used to be hospitalized for are going down while COVID goes up. And right. so, I was so trying, more trying to get people because there's so much fright out there. Every time someone has a cough, they go, do you have COVID? I have a sore throat, do I have COVID? I was trying to, to, to help people understand what's 
like at what point are you sick versus you've got a scratchy throat? I mean, we're gonna have a scratchy throat, take a bunch of vitamin C and it goes away. Like you're, that our bodies are meant to fight these things. And even though you test positive, it doesn't mean you're sick. Like where does it, what, what do you become that you've been sick with something? Well, I don't, Be it um, this I or don't know. Or like, the, you know what I mean? We're, yeah. You know, it has become so, um, I mean, obviously, it, if we could Photoshop COVID out and just go back to what we used to think of as this continuum between when we're healthy and then we become like, oh, I don't feel so great. And then we're worse. And oh my gosh, I think I got the flu. Right. So that's like this big spectrum of, of how we are feeling. And then COVID comes and sits on top of that and, and um, kind of makes a mess of it because at any stage along that progression from first symptoms all the way to flu-like, COVID is now a significant thought about what, about maybe it's causing that. Now, you know, I once, once upon a time, I heard a diagnosis of, um, I heard a diagnosis of, or I'm sorry, I heard a definition of, of health that was uh, the ability to move in and out of disease with ease, which I think is kind of brilliant because health, to be healthy doesn't mean you never experience symptoms or that you never get a cold or it means that when those things happen, we, we move out of them with ease. Right. They don't, they don't linger. Right. Um, Just like so, we all develop cancer in our bodies regularly. Yeah. The cancer cells, they come and they go. Up and, and then it goes. And, right. it, and so now, it, I mean, not that anybody really has ever embraced that idea that there is a, that symptoms are an aspect of health. And but they are an aspect, you know, fevers are, it's now well established. A fever is a protective thing. It's, right. it's something our body needs to do. And much of what we, we call acute illness is an adaptive beneficial response that we have to clean ourselves out a little bit. But now that's now reframed as potentially the first sign right. of a fatal disease. Right. When in fact, the fatalness is confined to a very small portion of the population, but we all, in fact, there have been a few really good surveys that have looked at the, um, the discrepancy between perceived risk and actual risk, you know, where they, mm -hmm. they ask people in each age group, right. how, worried. Um, how great a risk do they, do they personally feel they are at of having severe COVID? And it is wildly unrelated to the actual risk that people have within those age groups. Um, Do you anyway, know off the I'm, top of your head the latest risk factors of, at the different age groups? The latest risk factors right, for those um, different age groups. I, I think. I mean, the last I looked, I think like for anyone under forty-ish, it was like nothing, fraction of a percent. Yeah, to fifty or sixty, it was. I forget a, a, a point, maybe. I can't. You recall. mean the risk of having severe disease or dying? Correct. Yeah. Is that what you're talking about? Yeah, I mean, um, the median age of people dying in the US, the last figure I saw was 82. Right. M median meaning half below that age right. and half above, which is shocking when you think, okay, that's a lot above. So, and, and really it's not like a virus can tell how old you are. It's because that people who are older have lots of the comorbidities that are really putting people at risk. Right. They have much higher levels of nutrient deficiencies. And we all know, I mean, now it's crystal clear that specific nutrient deficiencies just increase the risk of serious disease and death by many, many times. Right. Um, it's, a, it's an absolute public health crime that this is not being made uh, known in a very headline and press release kind of a way so that people can just take some basic steps. Yeah. Um, but um, so anyway, I think I'm talking all around. I know I keep sending you all different directions because there, it's so complex and has so many implications. Um, somebody, I had a question that somebody asked from Rebecca and actually I was gonna ask this too. So thank you, Rebecca. 
Um, can people, if you test positive for PCR, which doesn't, on PCR, which doesn't necessarily mean you're sick, but you have stuff in your nose, but they tell you now you're COVID positive, can you pass that along? Can you infect someone, pass someone along because you've got, you tested positive, so you have something in you? Yeah, so, um, yeah, this whole idea, I mean, uh, gosh, it's a good question. So just uh, recently published was a really great study on where they use contact tracing. This was in, uh, uh, it's a region, it's a province in China, and I would say it wrong, so I won't try, but it was not Wuhan. But it, they were doing, they, it was a very large retrospective study where they, they took uh, 391 cases mm -hmm. of, uh, of COVID people. Confirmed serious so, symptomatic. No, actually not all symptomatic. So okay. they just had 391 with, of the um, cases and they traced out over 3,700 contacts uh, of those cases. And they looked at what, what are the things that are associated with transmission here? And what is very apparent is that transmission happens in homes. It is, so of all the transmissions that happen, 1% of them happened in healthcare settings and 0.1% happened in public, on public transportation. Mm -hmm. Essentially none, I mean, it's just not happening. The transmissions are happening in homes and they were specifically looking at transmission by asymptomatic people. Mm -hmm. So out of the, um, out of the total population, there was a small fraction, 8% of them, out of, the, out of all the cases, 8% were asymptomatic. And they then traced out how often did those people spread to other people. Mm -hmm. And ultimately what this study showed was that, was that transmission happens in homes, so it's among families with close contact with symptomatic people. Outside of that context, there is very, very low transmission that they were recording, which is absolutely against what we're being told. Well, we're, mean, talking, we're told about these super spreader events and we're told that people, that if you've got some of this, and again, they'll let me ask you, I mean, because germs are out there all the time. So if you say, I've got something that's happened to me, that's how we all develop our immunity and, and defenses against germs all over the place that I've got, I've got something, I picked up someplace, I'm fighting it, I'm not sick, I'm no whatever, my body's doing what it's supposed to. I go hug my daughter, she, you know, she develops that, you know, she catches a little bit of that, which she then develops because she doesn't get sick from it. But like, isn't that the way that we all develop immunity to all sorts of stuff? Yeah. <laughs> so what we're supposed to do. It's what we're supposed to do. Right. I mean, this whole idea of, of putting on masks and hiding in our houses is, is so counterintuitive when, when we're thinking about how are we going to develop immunity? Like, what do we think, like, are we ever gonna come out of the house? Like, it doesn't make any sense that we would stop this process by putting on masks or staying at home. Eventually we gotta take our mask off. And I'm trying to put it in perspective because it does definitely deserves a healthy level of respect. It's definitely a dangerous disease. It's definitely deadly for portions of the population, seriously deadly. So, um, so there's, it's definitely deserving of fear. I'm trying to put it in perspective again, because so much of this is under a microscope and we're paying attention to, but you might give someone a fragment of a virus, but I do that all the time. Right? That's how your kid gets strep and that's how your kid gets chicken pox. And that's, how, that's how, how all these diseases spread. That's the way it works. It's the way it works, yeah. Right. And, you know, many adults, if you test them, they're going right. to test positive for Epstein-Barr virus right. or test positive for you know, lots right. of other viruses yeah. that they've never had. You know, right. most adults will have Epstein-Barr by the time they're in mm -hmm. their 60s, but not because they've ever had chronic fatigue but just because they've been exposed, because that's what happens. Right, right. Let's talk about a, another piece of, and we spent a lot of time on the PCR because it's, again, this is the one that's so primary. 
Um, you told me another aspect that was going on in the testing was the replication, like that they were, I'm going to use my yeah. terminology, over replicating, like working yeah. super yeah. extra hard to find the, as my father used to say, the raisins in the rice pudding, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, um, and there have been, I know a number of people have been writing about this now and talking about it. Um, so it, to go back to what PCR is, uh, PCR is a way of amplifying small numbers of initial material. And to amplify means to go through cycles. So you find primers, you copy what's in between, and now what was one has become two. And now primer, copy, two becomes four. Eight, 16. Right. So the more cycles you go through, you get this exponential amplification. So imagine, just to make it easy, imagine that um, I have a bell that rings as soon as I reach 1 million copies. So if I start with one copy and I go to 2, 4, 8, 16, after some number, I will eventually ring that bell. Mm -hmm. I'm not exact, I don't know what number it will be, but, but eventually I'm going to get to a million and will ring the bell. Now, if I start with 10 copies, I'm not going to have to go through as many cycles to ring that bell. In fact, many fewer cycles. Right. So the fewer number of cycles, so in this lame analogy, ringing the bell is the same as registering positive on a PCR test. Right. So if, if, the PCR bell rings after um, 15 to 17 cycles. That corresponds, when they've done this testing, corresponds to close to 100% of the initial sample having infectious virus in it. Mm -hmm. However, if that bell doesn't ring until 34 cycles, that corresponds to only about 3% of the initial sample having infectious virus. If it takes 30, if it takes more than 34 cycles, essentially there is no infectious virus in the original because there were so few particles that you had to go through so many cycles in order to get your positive test that it, there's not even enough there to be infectious. So the key is, what are we calling, how many cycles are we calling a test positive by PCR in this country? And the answer is 40, 40 to 45 cycles. So we know that between 34 and 40 cycles, any test that becomes positive in that range, there is no infectious virus in that person. Uh, and certainly if, if it isn't positive until 45, so any positive test that we're seeing, now the problem is we're not privy to this information because it's not being made public. There was a great interview with Fauci and he said, he was asked directly this question about the, that the place that it becomes positive is just called the cycle threshold, mm -hmm. CT. And he was asked directly about the CT and positivity and the problem with it being set at 40. And he said, yeah, that's probably, most of that is not infectious virus. And he said, it probably should be set at 34. Now, why he's not making this a national standard, I have no idea, um, but he is well aware that testing positive by PCR after 34 cycles is not an infectious person. So, and we have no idea again, is it, when they do this test, are they just, running it until it rings a bell or do they run them all for 40 cycles and then see what's there? They, they, so they run them all for 40 cycles and they just look for when it becomes positive, if it does become positive. So they're all like, by default, we're gonna run 40 cycles, but if it, run, if it becomes positive, you see this, the positive spike happening at you know, uh, 25 cycles, I mean, they don't keep running it for the next 40, 
that it's just that 40 is set at the cutoff. If it hasn't become positive by 40, then we're not gonna, we'll call it a negative. Does the doctor get the result and know where it got cut off? So that should somebody ask, can they find out? So um, the labs don't report that when they report a positive test. Uh, and what I'm about to tell you, I only know because Fauci said this in his interview, um, the lab knows what cycle it became positive on. And if you contact the lab and ask them, they may or may not tell you, they're not required to tell you, but they could tell you. So what I would suggest is if someone does test positive, I mean, especially somebody just doing, who's asymptomatic and, and just had to get a PCR test for some reason, if it comes up positive, I would absolutely contact, in fact, at the time of doing the test, find out what lab is being used to right. do the test. And if it comes up positive, I would absolutely contact the lab and ask them if they would give out the information about what. Now, it's not like it's gonna work, you know, basically the consequence is gonna be the same because even if they were positive on, you know, cycle number uh, 39, by definition in this country, they're still positive PCR. It's just that we know that they're not infectious. With the, I mean, that's the grand irony of, of but, those. But positives. again, people are so frightened by it. And they don't, they get these, you know, these positive tests or they're running back. Again, I can test today, be negative, but tomorrow I got to test again. Tomorrow I got, like, even this process of re repetitive testing, just because you were yeah. exposed to somebody or just because you have a scratchy throat is, is this like, mouse wheel, hamster wheel of, because you never know. Right. And, and I mean, the variability of the testing is really tragic. And the fact that PCR with all of its unbelievable problems uh, is the gold standard to validate both antibody and rapid antigen tests. And so we have like a really crappy test being used to rate the effectiveness right. and or the sensitivity and specificity of these other tests. And it's like, it, it just becomes, it, it is such madness. So let's talk about the antigen. And I know we're, you know, cause I'm taking a long time on this. Um, let's talk about the, that antigen test. Cause that's also a, a nasal swab test and that's the rapid test. And I, that's I, ratio wise, PCR is still the vast majority of the tests that are being done versus- Oh yeah, tests, right? for yeah. sure. Uh, mm -hmm. But some people are getting the rapid test or they're trying to get the rapid test or they're needing to do it because, you know, the, to be able to get into a someplace, you know, that there's requirements to get a clean test. Um, so describe the antigen test now and and because that actually has a worse reputation for reliability than the PCR. Yeah. So um, with all of these, we're just, um, the question is, what are we looking for with the test. And so PCR, we're looking for the actual beads of nucleotides in the actual virus. With the rapid antigen test, um, so we, a viral particle has its core that is, you know, where the, in this case, the RNA is all bundled up in the core. And then it is surrounded by this complex of proteins, including the spike protein and the, um, envelope proteins and other proteins that sit on the membrane. And when the virus is you know, moving and circulating around in this world, it's the whole package. It's not just the, the RNA, but it's the viral proteins go along with it because you got to have those to, in order to infect another cell. The rapid antigen test, if we think of those proteins that are, that are enclosing the RNA, uh, if we think of those as a flag, each one is a flag, then the rapid antigen test has picked one of those flags to look and looks for it in particular. Mm -hmm. And so that's what the most, common, you know, the main rapid antigen test is one developed by um, Abbott and it's gotten that emergency uh, authorization from the FDA and is making its way, I think, out into the market more and more. But it is a, it uses the spike protein as it's, um, you know, that's the antigen that is looking for. So you swab and you put it in a vat and you throw in some stuff that if that spike protein is there, it will bind to it and essentially light up. 
And so you just look for, for something to light up. And if it is, then you say, okay, you've got that antigen in your system. So then where does that go wrong? Well, um, how was that test validated? Well, it was validated by PCR. So if- But do you get a positive or negative result on the antigen test, right? Uh -huh. Right, so the rapid test, but they say that that has a high incidence of false negatives, I think. So it's, no, it's more, more likely positive. false positive. Okay. Um, which is the real, that's, uh, I mean, it has problems in both directions. And right. keeping in mind, how do we know it's a false positive or a false negative? Well, because we tested them by PCR and they didn't agree. Um, and so we, we go into this question of how accurate is it, positive and negative both, by comparing it to a, a crappy test. Um, but all that aside, um, the rapid antigen test, if we were to start utilizing it as a way of testing lots of asymptomatic, low-risk individuals, we are going to end up with a whole lot of false positive people by that test, just because of the nature of the sensitivity of the test. So it's pick, um, again, is it picking up though? Why would it get false positives? If you've got the virus in you and it's picking up that unique spike protein, then- well, yeah. There, but again, it's you know they're going into the mucus. That doesn't necessarily mean that it's in your body. But an antigen that means you've started to mount an attack on it. So the uh, a couple of problems. Um, the main problem is that any kind of uh, any kind of uh, test in that way, where you're trying to do a specific bind, essentially you know, a lock and key thing. In biology, there's no such thing as perfectly specific. It just doesn't exist. Even you know monoclonal antibodies, which are as specific as an antibody can be, they're not totally specific. They can bind to things that they weren't intended to bind to. And so there really is no such thing as creating a something that only binds to spike protein. Beyond that is, uh, the problem that it kind of goes back to the same issue with PCR, the fact that you might have a spike protein antigen in your body doesn't necessarily mean that you have an infectious, infectious, the full infectious particle. So it's again that my body's, it's just measuring that my body's doing its thing. It may have just right. done its thing, yeah. Right. Um, so, I mean, this is, these problems are pretty, well understood and, and um, there's a good bit that has been written about the problem if we start moving toward uh, widespread antigen testing it's going to create big problems for how many false positives that it's going to throw out are these tests the pcr and the antigen test the rapid test more or less accurate than other types of strep test uh, flu test well, strep, I mean, those are both rapid antigen tests, actually. And so, so I mean- or Do those have similar false results or are those far more reliable? And why are those- Well, I don't, I, I can't answer right. you specifically. Right. I haven't really looked at that, but I would say, um, I would say the, the consequences of those being false are much, much lower than the consequences of this one being false. Yeah, Just so, I mean, again, I'm trying, this, this is something that I've tried to, to put in perspective from the start of this virus, as dangerous it is, it is, as it is, as novel as it is versus anything we've done, it's not that unique. When you think of 50 to 30 to 60 million people a year get the flu and yeah. millions die, you know, I guess about a half a million people die every year from it, half to 600,000 die every year of it. I think that's the number. I might be off. Of yeah, my... I actually I couldn't. Tell. I know like somewhere thirty to sixty thousand in the U.S. Right. So maybe my... I'm off on my on my desk. But that there's, you know, that we know there's a but but for, like, that this is the virus is virus again. That this but we're looking at everything so in detail. And yes, more people die of this than have died of the flu. There's no question about it. Um, but but again, what I would say to that that you just said, um, just to interject is. Uh, 
that now the CDC has this combined thing um, where it used to be they kept influenza and pneumonia separate and COVID over here. And now they are, it's CUI or it's, it's some acronym, meaning that they now they group them all together now in statistics. The CDC has said that they're not gonna collect data on influenza for this year because it's now it's all part of the same pile. But it's um, a different virus and it's affecting people's bodies in different ways. Yeah, I know, don't take it up with me. <laughs> Um, no, it's, um, it really is, it's hard to believe that this could all be done without understanding how terribly it would mess up tracking. Um, well, and when and, you look at the hospital stats now, again, I mean, that, cause again, they're saying the hospitals are high now, the hospitals were near capacity in the spring, but they knocked everybody else out of the hospital. Now they're still, the hospitals are doing business and they've got COVID patients that are in there. They're definitely going up. But if you lay overlay the flu, there's no flu, zero, none, zippo happening. But the overall hospital, I saw something the other day that was a comparison of a year ago, same week in time a year ago now versus then, net net total hospitalization approximately the same. Some states a little higher, some states a little lower, but net net basically the same, except that the the reasons why, right? So that yeah, it was, yeah. And you know what? Also, I just had posted recently about this. Uh, and uh, and just by the way, I'll just put out there, I'm, I don't do Facebook anymore, but anybody who wants to read what I'm writing about COVID, I do that. I do it all on MeWe. And so if you become a member over on MeWe and, and just look up my name, I have a, a page that I post a lot of stuff to. Um, uh, there, I recently, you know, because we hear about the overwhelm in the hospitals, and I recently just did a look and they've been talking about hospitals at the breaking point since essentially 2000. And I mean, I just stopped looking after a while because there's so much coming up. But as far back as 2003, they were saying, you know, the population of LA keeps growing, but our hospital capacity is not. And we're soon going to be beyond what we can handle. Or there was a thing in Atlanta in 2007 saying, if we have another severe flu season, this is going to overwhelm our hospitals because we don't have the capacity. And there were a number of articles talking about how this country is reaching its capacity and any increased burden is going to strain everything. And then I found out, I looked up the number of hospital beds available in this country has declined dramatically since yeah. 2000. We have less capacity than we had then. Mm -hmm. And on top of that, the number of healthcare workers employed in this country has been a positive number every year since 1980, except for two little tiny negative in two separate years that happened, there was a negative. And then in the year 2020, it's a drop of like 30,000. It is a ginormous drop in the number of healthcare employees. Because remember back in the first wave of all this, hospitals were empty because they only had COVID patients and right. they wouldn't let anyone else in. And they laid off a bunch of healthcare workers. Yeah, there were a lot of specialists that were having serious economic problems. They were out of work totally. just like all the restaurant owners. Yeah. Totally. And so now hospitals are understaffed. They were already set to break under increased pressure. And so now we're testing people, everybody who comes in gets tested. We have more COVID patients in the hospital. Hospitals are strained beyond capacity. We don't have enough healthcare, healthcare workers. You know, we hear the stories about they're exhausted and uh, overworked. And I mean, it's just like, it's like, this is a, it's a setup. Well, so, you know, two things. I, I always feel that I, I don't like to leave people frustrated and confused. <laughs> so two questions for you. Yeah. Question number one, again, we were talking about, on the one hand, this overstatement or this overclassification of COVID positive, right? So that the case numbers are so crazy high, but they're not necessarily, right? So these false positives. On the other hand, you're just talking about hospitalizations that are bursting at the seams, although they're classifying heart arrhythmia as COVID if they happen to get a positive PCR test. And then we've got deaths that are going up. So what's the truth? Is this really, is this getting worse? Is this, what's the, the second spike, this other 
you know, this, I guess it's kind of a third spider. It's the biggest, bigger than the, what was later in the summer. Um, what's true? Is it, is it bad? Is it not? Is it spiking? Is it not? Um, we have no way of knowing the answer to that question. Right. PCR has made it so incredibly sloppy that we can't know, that we can no longer discern what the truth is. In the state of Oregon, anybody testing positive by PCR within 60 days of entering a hospital is in the hospital because of COVID. Like, Even if they you came can't, in from appendicitis. You can't, absolutely, you can't right. possibly discern what's true then about hospitalizations in Oregon because by definition, they've made it impossible to know. So to leave on a, on a better note, what I think is clear beyond question is how protective very basic therapies are. We know now with, with clarity that maintaining minimally adequate vitamin D drops the risk of severe disease by something like 25 times. Mm -hmm. We know uh, that when they supplemented every patient that entered a hospital with tiny doses of vitamin D, vitamin B12, and magnesium, I think, the rate of severe disease dropped again. It was like 12 or 15 times lower rate of severe disease and nobody died just by such an easy intervention. Right. Um, and nobody so, like we have this, this idea of universal risk, but, but really um, there are so many easily accessible things that we can be doing. In fact, another study just came out showing that exercise is, is it, it looks to be, exercise is a significant risk reducer, duh. Mm -hmm. I mean, like this is all common sense, but right. it's nice to finally have the studies coming out that are showing this stuff. That so, sounds more like it's associative because on the flip side, obesity and diabetes increases your risk. So is that just that people who exercise have a lower incidence? I'm gonna guess that they controlled for that yeah. and that it. I, did, I, I saw the headline come out right. and I didn't read the study, but I'm guessing that they would have needed to control for that to be right. sure that they weren't just <laughs> But I mean, maybe not, I don't know for sure. I read plenty of associative studies and go, yeah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, so one yeah. other net thing, Greg, so what should people do about testing? So we've just totally annihilated PCR testing as something that you can trust. So what should people do? What's, what's your recommendation in terms of how people should proceed? If they, you know, should they get tested? Shouldn't they? Sometimes you have no choice. Like what do, what do they do about it? Um, well, gosh. Um, my, I mean, I think personally, I, I think doing antibody testing is is a good thing, because not that it is. I know that it's foolproof, but I would be psyched to find out that I have I, that I can show the airlines that I have the antibodies. Mm -hmm. um, uh, in terms of like, what is the best test to do? Well, but let's back up because we really didn't talk about the antibody testing at all. That would be, I mean, certainly if you've, if you've had it, you know you've had it and theoretically you've gotten antibodies. Are you talking about even people that haven't been sick rather than get a PCR screening test to go get the blood test and see if they've developed antibodies? Is so yeah, they've done, done those, they've done those tests. And, and there've been uh, a number of just um, uh, epidemiological kind of tests where they find seroprevalence, which is to say antibody positivity in right. the general population. Right. These aren't people that have been sick, but they use these to find out how widespread the virus is within a population. Yeah. And when they've done those studies, they found it to be much more widespread than, it, than we really think it is. That there are a number of people who are testing positive to uh, on these tests. So, um, I, I mean, it depends on what your, in terms of what's the best test to do, it depends on what the goal of that test is. I mean, if I, if somebody's going to do a PCR test, it would be worth contacting the lab that it's going to run through and say, would they be willing to release the CT value right. of the test if it is positive? And that's because if you've got symptoms, because that's what you need to, if you've got symptoms and you need to find out, that's the steps with that. Sure. Right. Yeah. Um, so yeah, each test is just giving different kind of information. And I know for people that are, that are really 
kind of freaked out about did they get exposed or not exposed. Um, gosh, I, I personally would not be inclined to go with PCR as a first thing. Um, and if I did PCR, I would find out about that CT value thing because if the lab is not going to give it up, I don't want to know well, because right. that, that could be a false scare. Mm -hmm. um, I would then probably go with the antibody test and I would do the one um, that Abbott, <clears throat> Abbott developed um, just because it's the most widespread. It seems to have the highest sensitivity and specificity. But again, you can't do an antibody test. If you have if I had a symptom last week or was exposed last week, it would take it would take a while for antibodies to develop unless you just wanted to know, get a baseline right now, have I been exposed? I literally, it's funny, I was in a restaurant the other day. Yes, I do eat in restaurants. And a woman nearby, I overheard her talking, saying to her friend that she'd gotten an antibody test for some reason. She'd never been sick, but suddenly she, she, she had antibodies, which is exactly what you're talking. And exactly what we were saying in terms of just living life and developing your, your immune system, yeah. developing response yeah. to things. Yeah. And there are studies about that, about how maybe we're all developing natural immunity because mm -hmm. we're touching surfaces that have these fomites, the little, right. you know, decayed particles, and we're just getting exposed. We're all developing our immunity in that way. All right. Greg Nye, thank you very much. Again, anyone wants to learn more about Greg, his website is immersionhealthpdx.com. And WeMe, is that W-E-M-E? -E? I had never heard. Oh, oh MeWe. MeWe. Mewe, M E W E dot com. Okay. It's like a, it's the new Facebook because Facebook is evil and all that. Um, oh, I shouldn't say that on Facebook Live, should I? And you're from um, Portland. What are you saying? <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, yeah, I've just transferred all my social stuff over to Mewe. Interesting. All right. Well, thank you very much. I really appreciate yes, it. Thank you for having me. That was right. a fun talk. Okay. And if anybody has additional questions, can they put them in and I'll forward them along if they have any specific questions we need some answers to? Oh yeah, of course, totally. Great, okay, yeah. and friends, don't forget, share this, let other people know about these and come on back next week, talking about happiness and exercise actually. So there we go. Awesome. Thank you so much, Greg. Bye. Yes, thank you.